Um, welcome to the relief of actually having the panel start. <laughs> which is quite really uh, I'm Tim Wagner. I'm going to be the moderator. I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves. And I'm just going to go by whoever's like on my screen, how the images are stacked. So the first one that I see there is Sarah. So why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sarah Langan, and uh, I've been writing horror and other genre fiction for a long time. Um, and <laughs> my most recent book is called Good Neighbors, and it came out this year. And uh, thank you guys for waiting so much. Ian, how about you? Sure. Uh, hi, folks. My name is Ian Munishwar. I am a writer and teacher based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, in terms of my writing, I work mostly in the world of short fiction. Uh, you can find some of my recent short stories in magazines like Black Static and The Dark and forthcoming from Nightmare. Um, I'm also an adjunct writing instructor at a couple of universities just outside of Boston. I mostly teach composition, but every now and again, I get the opportunity to teach a class in the craft of horror, which is one of my very favorite things to think about and talk about. So I'm thrilled to, to be here and to have the chance to do it. Awesome. Karen? Hi, I'm Karen Warren. I'm coming from uh, Australia, so it's morning time for me. Um, and like Sarah, I've been writing horror for a really long time as well. Always from my very first stories, always had elements of horror. Even when I write science fiction, there's horror there, um, which is partly about just exploring the nature of the world and what lies beneath the veneer of um, what we consider to be acceptable behaviour and how quickly that can turn on its head. Ursula? Hi, I'm Ursula Vernon. Uh, under that name, I actually am a children's book author, but uh, as a, uh, uh, under the pen name T. Kingfisher, I write horror. Uh, my most recent book was The Hollow Places. And uh, much like Karen, even when I was writing what I kept claiming were fluffy romances, I was being told there were a lot of horror elements in them <laughs> and that normal romance did not involve quite so many severed heads, so. <laughs> I didn't realize there was a quota that for severed heads in the romance one. Uh, apparently oh, most did. of the time it's zero, so I, I was okay. picking up good. a lot of uh, lost time. Good to know. Good to know. Uh, like I said, I'm Tim Wagner. i uh, written about 51 books or so, uh, half original, half tie-ins, most horror or horror-related or I sneak the horror in just like everybody else when nobody's looking. Uh, teach uh, full-time at Sinclair Community College in Dayton, Ohio. Teach composition and creative writing. And uh, you're welcome. We got, I have the, the chat window open here. So is any, if anybody has questions, put them in there and we'll, you know, get to them as we can. Um, right before this uh, started streaming live, we were asked if we could keep, you know, going on past the normal or originally scheduled end time of nine o'clock so we'll see if we can do that they'll probably tell us when to stop we don't know we're just going to keep talking <laughs> <laughs> so uh wrote down a bunch of questions when i found out i was the moderator this afternoon uh, one of the things that i found i was telling everybody before uh, we started was that when i was looking up on the internet just for different articles about relief and horror and comfort and horror one of them i found was on a urology practices website i don't know why because it had nothing to do with urology um, but they had some really interesting kind of, uh, uh, lists of things in terms of just like why people, uh, find comfort in horror. So without giving away what, what they say yet, um, does anybody want to go ahead and talk about why you think people find comfort in horror? Because the way that article was presented was like the, the paradox of like you, people wouldn't normally think of comfort and horror. Um, so anybody, anybody want to start? Sarah, I guess we can keep on going the same order as before. Oh, sure. Well, uh, we were talking a little bit about this before it started uh, live, but um, I think people find comfort in horror because it articulates their fears and expresses them. I think that's true. And the comfort is often those fears have never been expressed before in this specific way. And so they can sort of with, you know, in a movie with an audience or with a book, just, just feel as if they're known and their fears are known and, and, and live through them. And uh, we were just talking a little bit um, 
my concern with the quote, the Wes Craven quote is just, um, I don't think that it's a horror writer's job to take people's pre-existing fears and sort of harness them because there's something cynical about that to me. Um, and I think what's more important is to think about what they really ought to be afraid of and distinctly show them why they ought to be afraid of that thing. And catharsis or non-catharsis, um, that's where I'm coming from. Right. Ian, how about you? Yeah, I, I really like everything that, that Sarah just said. And I'm curious for us to come back to this idea of catharsis and whether or not it's like the, the job of the horror text to to provide that for anyone, because my, my suspicion is that it's not, but I'm curious to know what everyone else has to think. Um, I, have, I have a lot of feelings about this question, but I think I wanted to start with a quote from um, Jordan Peele that I came across uh, in one of his interviews, where he just offhandedly described horror as um, the valve through which uh, writers can sort of express their anxieties and their fears. And that, that, that metaphor really stuck out to me. I think it's a really apt metaphor in some ways because it does imply or suggest a sort of control that it gives the author to, to put something on the page. And so I put that anxiety on the page, that fear on the page um, and, and control it in such a way that it can become accessible for the reader. And while I do think that horror can provide relief in that it shows an anxiety, it allows us to identify with an anxiety that maybe we haven't seen expressed before, as, as Sarah said. I think for me, one of the reasons why I read horror as an anxious person is that it allows me to see how other people experience anxieties differently from me. And that sort of creates a space in which I can reflect on my own. Um, anxieties and how I process them. And that's often the horror that I respond best to is when characters react to situations differently from the way I would or experience things differently from the way I would. Okay, Karen? Uh, all very, very interesting. Um, and um, one of my things that I've been thinking about is how um, manipulative horror is um, as a genre and as writers of horror, how we manipulate all of these things like people's anxieties and people's uh, fears that they acknowledge or, as Sarah says, fears that they really should be acknowledging. Um, we kind of do take advantage of that. It's like people writing romance take, take advantage of people's desire to be loved and to find that magical Scottish person running across the, you know, <laughs> across the, across the green lawn or whatever. Um, and the tragic type fiction takes advantage of people's you know, it, I mean, the, the cathartic need to cry and how, how satisfying a good cry can be. In horror, we're taking advantage of people's um, fears and I guess we're not deliberately manipulating them, but I think that we actually are and that's why horror works is because we are using people's fears to make them um, feel this strong emotion that we hope to evoke. Okay, Ursula? Uh these are all such good and thoughtful answers that I feel a little bad that mine is that uh, I like to write things that I particularly am scared about because misery loves company. So if I can make everybody else as scared of the thing, you know, of looking out the window and seeing a face or whatever as I am, then uh, uh, yay, I'm not a weirdo anymore. <laughs> I, I think there's, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, trying to not necessarily work out because work out sounds like uh, I'm getting through it in some way and I'm totally not but uh, I and I'm not saying that you know fiction writing is therapy for me or anything but just that uh, it it works best for me if I am writing things that genuinely freak me out and once I've uh, uh, once I'm sufficiently freaked out it sort of follows along that the reader is going to go Yep. Okay. That's not okay. And uh, so, yeah. Yeah, that sounds like it. It, it kind of connects to some some of the stuff Ian was saying about the being able to to identify with uh, the the characters in a horror story. It was one of the things that I read in the articles I was looking this afternoon that really articulates something I hadn't thought of before. But one of the points that was made was that a horror story allows people to see that it's okay to be afraid of it. It's okay to be a weirdo. I mean, from what Ursula was saying, you know, why I could feel that in terms of like being a horror, you know, freak and finding other horror freaks and being part of a tribe, uh, 
the idea that it was kind of validating in some ways the because I grew up with a family that believed the world was so dangerous you should not step outside the door because you'd probably die the moment you stepped outside the door and it was a huge relief for me to become an adult and find out that didn't ha- <laughs> that didn't happen uh, but reading horror stories and things like that really helped me identify it in a lot of ways um, if nothing else it was just the you know the dark things of uh, inside me or inside my mind my reaction to the world was reflected in these stories from other people. Uh, so I, I guess I did find that comforting. Uh, but we were talking about catharsis before, and you know, Ian, you said you wanted to come back to it. So um, why don't we start with you, Ian? And you can go ahead and talk. Is there a catharsis in horror? You're saying you suspect that it's not necessarily the job of a horror story to, to provide catharsis. I, I don't. I don't really think it's the job of any piece of fiction to do any one thing. So I would. I would never like prescribe any sort of rules like that. But the question that was posed to us was about you know what what types of catharsis can literature potentially offer that film wouldn't, and and vice versa. And it's an interesting question, but I just got hung up on the on the catharsis part of it uh, and, and couldn't quite get past that. Um, I, I'm sorry. So your question was just like, is it the job of the, or just whatever you want to say about the, do you think that, you know, horror does provide a catharsis for people? Does it have a cathartic effect? I think it absolutely does have the potential to, to produce catharsis. Um, and uh, there are a number of different ways in which, in which that could happen. Um, so one of the other things I was thinking about, one of the other ways in which horror might provide relief and then a type of catharsis through that relief. Um, I was thinking a lot about the film Get Out coming into this panel in part because I'm supposed to be teaching it uh, later and I've just been been dwelling on it a bit. And I think one of the things that makes Get Out so unique or makes the type of relief that Get Out provides so unique is that it is centering a type of fear that is not usually centered inside of the horror narrative. It's centering the fear of predominantly white spaces. And for a whole new uh, you know, for, for lots of communities of color coming to that film, um, it suddenly provided a new type of relief, the, it being able to identify with that type of horror. So I do think that a film like Get Out has the, uh, uh, gives us the opportunity to experience a new type of viewing catharsis. Um, but I don't think that every horror narrative is necessarily setting out to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, just listening to what you're saying, it occurs to me too that it gives us new vocabulary because people can say Get Out as you know, the, the whole concept behind that, that they can talk about in a way they might not have been able to before as easily. That's really interesting. Sarah, you were talking about catharsis too earlier when we were, you know, not yet live and just talking to, to each other. What do you think about catharsis and horror? Well, you know, so when I think of, I thought of Get Out and I love Get Out and it's sort of Get Out as Jordan Peele pulling out things that we hadn't seen before and saying, no, oh, maybe you should be afraid of this. Like, you know, liberal nonsense, thoughts and prayers. And, uh, you know, then you look back at the Wes Craven years and I feel like what was being articulated and the kinds of catharsis used were, you know, fears of sex, fears of independent women, these kinds of things that it's like, you know, I really don't wanna see. And I don't, whether or not people have those fears is not my problem. So, so I think catharsis has to be, you have to be really careful about it and how it's used and what fears you're talking about. Um, and no, it's, I mean, it's not always necessary, but I think the truth is what makes a satisfying story, we're, we're talking about movies, but there's plenty of novels and the most successful ones are the ones that end on a cathartic note, some kind of surprise or shock or something revealed, you know, um, so, so just employing that is, is, is super important. It's just, what are you saying when you do it? So you wanna, you're, you're saying that horror creators should be uh, careful of the kind of, I don't know, message their catharsis sends? Cause as you were talking, I was thinking of the Stepford Wives. And you know, the first time I watched this as a kid, I was like, oh, this is horrible. You know, they've all become robots. And then as I get older, I'm like, are there some men out there watching this going, oh yeah, <laughs> this is a happy ending because he's got a, you know, a completely obedient robot wife here. 
Well, it's not your fault if people misunderstand what you've written. Like I just reread Stepford Wives and it's spectacular. And so is Rosemary's mm -hmm. Baby. And he's, he's mm -hmm. articulate. I mean, he, had, he lived in this town in Connecticut and he was like, this is what it does to women. These men get together and they conspire and they keep them home. It's not a joke. Like it's a horrible thing that's happening. And he wrote about it. And it's funny you bring that up because I like am obsessed with how do people react to these kinds of stories. So I went on Amazon and I looked at how everyone was reacting to Stepford Wives. And they were like, I hated it. It's so mean. It's so, you know, misogynist. Like there are all those one star reviews. And you're like, well, some people can't be reached. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I think like, there's also an era that involved too, because I think that probably hit a lot harder at the time it came out than it necessarily would now. There's there's a, a generational gap. Like uh, Rosemary's Baby is uh, one of the the big horror elements is that her husband and the other people in the apartment building have complete control basically over her medical care and everything else and she has no agency whatsoever and as a fear uh that probably hit i mean that one still you know kind of hits but i think it probably hit a lot harder when it came out or uh the yellow wallpaper for example uh none of us are ever going to be in the the uh postpartum rest cure in a room thing so it's not as immediate and visceral a thing that we might have to deal with i think on the the same level uh it still works but i don't know if it hits as hard as it might have at the time but that, like, I mean, that one still absolutely resonates with me as a as a parent or you know my, my kids are grown up now but you know when they were little the you were still so controlled by what the childhood nurse had to say and they'd say something different every time you went there and, be, you know, and all of them, almost all of them made you feel like you were doing something wrong and they were right. And the, you'd go to kids' playgroup and everyone was saying, oh, well, my kid's eaten seven carrot sticks today and, you're my, you know, and there was still this incredible level of control going on um, that I felt really confined by. Um, so I that really, and, and certainly not my, my family didn't treat me like that, my husband didn't treat me like that, but there was absolute resonances um, in there, which I think stay to this day, which is the sort of thing I guess we can, we can tap into. And whether or not I feel relief or catharsis in reading that story, I don't think so. And I guess it, all it does is really uh, underline my own circumstance at the time as well. So maybe, maybe that's one of the things that horror does as well. It underlines or emphasises um, these these sorts of things are not necessarily you don't necessarily I'm, I'm concerned with the concept of relief in horror that it makes you feel better and sorts things out um, I'm not sure that it really does that but it does certainly emphasize and um, bring to the fore some yes. of these things and bring it you know put a mirror up I always say bring brings a mirror puts a mirror in front of your own face and you can see if you're dead or not <laughs> you know if your breath is showing up on this on the on the glass um, yeah, so I think, and, and same with Rosemary's Baby as well, and Stephen Wiles, I love, I love the reaction that some people have to that, that, the misunderstanding of it, and the fact, as you say, Tim, that some people, some people are definitely going to say, oh, yeah, that looks good, I think that, that could work, you know, but that's absolutely part of the horror itself, isn't it? Well, and we're also talking about stories that have remarkable staying power, so tapped into something visceral enough that, you know, we're still talking yes. about it. At this point, uh, there was probably a lot of contemporary horror at the time that uh, vanished without a trace that that might have worked in, you know, 19 whatever. But today we're like, oh, yeah, that's quaint. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> One thing I do think about on in terms of catharsis or relief is the and this is certainly not universal in all horror by any stretch of the imagination, but the ones with for lack of a better term, happy endings. Uh, it reminds me of the G.K. Chesterton quote that uh, uh, fairy tales exist not to uh, convince children they're dragons, but to teach them the dragons can be slain. It's the, uh, uh, okay, terrible thing has happened, but character has lived through it. And I think there's a certain relief in someone can survive this. It's like the final girl thing. Okay, we're all uh, imagining we are the final girl instead of the one killed in the first 10 minutes of the uh, of the movie, which, you know, realistically, I would absolutely be killed in the first 10 minutes of the movie, but that's not who I'm necessarily identifying with. So in the ones with a, a sort of positive ending, I think there's a, uh, we have looked at the, the terrible, scary monster 
and we lived through it and somebody killed the monster or the monster has gone away. And so there's a, a great relief to the, the happy ending, I think, not necessarily as a blueprint for how to get through it, but as a, it is possible to get through this. Do you think there's a physical relief? Just when you're talking, I'm wondering about that, that actual physical relief when you get when something's over. Like, you know, if you have a coughing fit and when you're no longer coughing, it's like a real physical sense of comfort to not be coughing anymore. Do you reckon reading and watching horror has a similar physical, so we get like that kind of buzz of it not being awful anymore or not being scary? Do you reckon it's a, well, there's like a physical relief in it? You know, the roller coaster, you get a whole yeah. rush of adrenaline yes. and then at the end you're like, Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm awesome because you had the whole adrenaline rush, so you feel ready to go fight a tiger, but you don't actually have to because you know you're off the roller coaster now. Yeah, a couple of the articles I read discussed the the, the physiological component of feeling good afterwards. You know, it's almost like the, the old joke about somebody like hitting their hand with a hammer just because it feels so good when they stop. <laughs> yes. And yes. but there literally are yeah. chemicals that are dumped into your brain once it's over with that uh, mm -hmm. endorphins create kind of a high almost. And so maybe, I mean, it's not just a, a psychological thing, it could be very physiological. I would imagine you get that probably more often from a film, pro, I would think, than, than maybe a book. It probably depends on the book or the story. Mm -hmm. I, you I think, think the more yeah, jump scares and sort different. of adrenaline motions you have in a, in a movie, probably the more, uh, the more physical hindbrain stuff. I'm not saying you couldn't do it on a psychological thriller, but it's probably harder mm -hmm. to uh, to pull off. Right, right. Sarah, do you have any, any thoughts percolating as, as we've been talking? No, I mean, I, I mean, I I like this conversation a lot. <laughs> you know, yes. I think, I, I, what is relief and why do you need it? And um, I, I I keep, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a broken record but I you know I think when you have these feelings of relief or cathartic experiences what you've seen um sort of gets indelibly ingrained into your brain um in ways that are very powerful and I think uh that's interesting too mm -hmm. I've always thought that the the happy ending in or in a lot of ways is dishonest because they're you know, if they're, co they're completely fine, I mean, at least a, a, a number of Stephen King books, especially when they follow up on what happened to somebody, you know, you find out in a future book what happened to somebody in, in the one we just read. And these people are scarred and they are not happy. Uh, you know, they've been traumatized by what they've been through. And, you know, I think it would be really interesting to do a, a, the horror story that's set 20 years after <laughs> the whatever happened and watch the, the effect on different people what it's done to their lives. You know, that seems like that, the, that in a lot of ways, stories like that are designed to help you think that, yes, there is, you know, it's like a comforting illusion. Yes, there's control. Yes, there's a happy ending. Yes, you can defeat death and the final girl's eternal because the movie ends and she's still alive. So she, she's never going to age. You know, it's almost like a, a perfect afterlife for somebody. Well, that's all books, though. I mean, you can't, like, it's not like we end all books with, and then they finally died of old age at the age of 90. <laughs> yeah. So uh, to a certain extent, you know, you you, you got to right. end the book somewhere. And I, yeah. I think that there's a, a certain, um, most of my characters, you know, come out with, obviously they have PTSD, who wouldn't? And uh, the most recent one is like, I have no health insurance. I messed up my knee in the horrible other world. And now I am limping around the, the building, you know, <laughs> slamming a lot of Tylenol all the time. So, uh, but it's still the, I, I think uh, bloody but unbowed is perhaps not a completely flowers and, and hearts kind of ending, but a however wounded I got through it yay me, uh, is as close to a happy ending as, as perhaps, uh, I still consider that a happy ending, even if it's not a, a completely sitcom start back at, at stage one with everything reset kind of ending. Right. Well, we got a number of questions, so let me back up here a little bit. So one of the questions is from Sarah. Uh, Sarah Glassman said, uh, mentioning Get Out makes me wonder about horror that isn't catharsis exactly, but engages fiction to show people what is terrific, horrific to someone else, like empathy horror. So the idea would be that you can empathize with somebody else's fears, even if they aren't your own, maybe. 
So it's this horror that employs the mirror gene question mark. I, I don't think it's exactly Sarah's what? question. I think she's just typing all over all the ones from Discord, but yes. All right. Well, I think that's this idea. There's the idea of though that you can like a lot of literature can get you to know somebody else's experience or what it's like to be you know, the other from whatever you may be, whether it's somebody who lived before you, somebody that's contemporary, but living in different circumstances, or just another human being with different perspectives. So, I mean, do you think that can work? I think that all horror has been doing that through time, right? It's just for a long time, what was shown to audiences is that what was the source of horror, uh, you know, in film was often like queerness or was often like, black and brown people. Um, it's just that to predominantly white audiences, you know, you weren't, um, that wasn't registering as much. And now that we have more creators of color sort of decentering those fears and recenter and centering new fears inside of the horror story, um, you know, white audiences are being asked to think a little bit more critically about what, what is othered and for whom is the other a source of horror. And I think that's probably a good question for any horror writer to ask themselves as they embark on a new project. There's still like in any storytelling, you still have to try and find that connection to your viewer or your reader, no matter how different they are from the from the characters or the fears that you're creating. You still have to connect um, to your your reader, don't you, in one way or another. Um, so it can't just be something it just pure, that they're just purely observing or purely reading. I guess you have to try to still draw them in in a, at, a, at a human level. Um, yeah, which is happening a lot, I think, with, with some of this amazing, amazing new fiction and film that we're seeing these days. Okay. Sarah, Ursula, do you have anything to respond to the question or the idea? Uh, the along? only thing I can think of off the top of my head is I think that we are seeing... Uh, horror that maybe doesn't necessarily depend as much on uh, the white person's sense of invulnerability, if that makes sense. Like, you can write 10,000 books about how the nice white couple with uh, the first kid buys the house that turns out to be haunted, and uh, and I mean, take anything I say with a grain of salt, I'm a white chick from the suburbs, but like every time uh, I, I'm thinking about all the times on social media where you get someone going, hey, I just found a creepy murder oubliette in my apartment. Let me go into it. And they're inevitably a white person. And all of the black people in the comments are like, you are going to be killed. This is, you know, you, you know, this is a terrible idea. And I think part of the reason that uh, uh, because being white you have this sort of built-in sense of invulnerability that of course the world will cater to you and you can kind of follow that into trouble whereas if uh and uh, this is this is a, a guess but and feel free anyone to correct me if i'm wrong i think if you do not live with that privilege inherently you have a much greater sense that if there is a murder oubliette in the basement don't rent the damn house because you will not be saved merely by the fact that you know the world caters to you so yeah i i think that we're starting hopefully to see horror that does not rely so much on their idyllic suburban life turned suddenly to horror as opposed to uh life was not idyllic and it was scary and this is the scary stuff that happens when you're not you know the nice white couple with the kid who goes around saying red rum red rum a lot hmm. yeah, it's one of my favorite movies or horror movies from other countries so that uh and, and you know especially non uh in, I don't want to say non-english speaking countries but countries where people are not predominantly like uh english or because you see so many, at least in America, I have grown up, seen so many different things from England that it feels almost like my, my other country, kind of. More stuff from England than Canada. So, uh, but seeing things from like movies from Pakistan or movies from wherever, Indonesia. And I love seeing the different story patterns. I love seeing the different art. I love not knowing how the story is going to unfold because even the, just the narrative structures are different. So not only is there that wonderful sort of getting a sense of, you know, what fears might be like for people in other places in the world, what, how the worldview is different. There's just this wonderful narrative difference that I get too. Um, we had another question about what's our favorite horror or comfort 
horror trope, favorite slash comfort horror trope. Does anybody have one? I always really liked the the old person who has seen all this shit before, and uh, the and it's I mean it's only whether it's a horror movie or not we can we can sort of you know uh, waffle on but uh, the granddad at the end of the Lost Boys going you know the one thing I never could stand was all the damn vampires and I I yeah I always love that. Okay. Anybody else? Well, I don't read horror for comfort at all, so I'm not. I'm really not looking for comfort in my horror fiction. I'm. I'm. If I if I start reading and it's something I know it's going to happen or it's an old trope, then I'll stop reading and skip that story and move on to the next one. So I am looking for new something that's new. If it's a real reinvention of tropes, then fine. But yeah, so I don't. I find irritation in old tropes, to be honest, as opposed to comfort. <laughs> Yeah. I, I do. I definitely do read for comfort. Uh, and this actually, if we have time, I would love to get at, um, I've been wondering a lot about the connection between horror and nostalgia. Um, and because a lot of the, the horror tropes I love are like kids on bikes, kids on bikes, finding bad things. I will read all of those books or put me in any like creaky old house with a leaking ceiling. I will probably love that book. Um, uh, doppelgangers, I'll have them all. Um, so like there are definitely certain tropes that I just enjoy revisiting. Um, uh, and I do see a question later on about this, this childhood horror thing. Um, I have some sort of fuzzy ideas about that connection between horror and nostalgia, but if we're able to get back to it, I would love to hear all of your thoughts about it. Okay. That sounds good. Sarah, do you have a comfort, comfort horror trope? No, I really like nostalgia drives me crazy. Drives me crazy. Like, <laughs> I feel like it's such a cynical, like, I know how to get people to like this. I'll throw in, you know, the haunted house yeah. with the happy couple the already happened, was, yeah. or the kids on the bikes. And, you know, it's like, right. it's like nostalgia heaped on nostalgia, heaped on nostalgia, heaped on an event that never happened. And we've all told right. ourselves did happen. And that's comforting because if we, because we don't want to know what actually happened. Right. I feel like what's really interesting about horror, though, is that it has the capacity to allow the reader simultaneously to indulge that nostalgia, but also to violently disrupt that nostalgia. And I, I, I'm just curious about all of your thoughts about that, because I agree that the nostalgia can become cloying and it can be very problematic, but it's horror seems well positioned to complicate that. I'll also point out that I live in, I, I was right, been working on this latest horror novel and I wanted to make a joke about the movie The Crow, and then I did the math and realized my heroine would have been three. <laughs> and I was like, "Me? Uh, okay, first of all, ouch! I I feel my my bones turning to dust. And secondly, uh, possibly some of what we write may become nostalgia involuntarily after a point." <laughs> <laughs> no, <Yeah>. stop. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't. I don't have any comfort either, other than maybe sometimes watching movies I used to watch as a kid, like times when I may go through all the Universal horror movies or all the Hammer movies that I have, or all the Edgar Allan Poe, Roger Corman movies. But I don't have a trope. I mean, I usually I don't reread books much either. I, I look for new things, things that I just can't anticipate or didn't expect, or that are just supposed to be super awesome because everybody says it's awesome. That's the best thing about social media, as far as I'm concerned, is movie movie wrecks and book wrecks. That's, mm. that's what I live for. We've got another question here about what do we think of horror novels or, or movies or anything, I guess, designed to deny someone any relief, a literary equivalent of a Lars von Trier film. I love Lars von Trier so much, and I found Dogville so upsetting, but also, like, completely relieving. <laughs> like, yeah. I was like, yep, <laughs> that's right. So I don't know. I'm, I, other people can talk now, but I just want to <laughs> Lars von Trier and Dogville. No, I, I totally agree. I was actually blown away. Um, I watched a version of it when I was living in Fiji for a bit, and it was actually French, um, dubbed in French, 
And we watched probably 45 minutes thinking that's what how it was meant to be. And, of course, it wasn't. So we had to go back to the beginning and watch it again. But anyway, I, I absolutely love it. And I love that the nihilism. I actually get relief in that sense of nihilism. And I get relief in a horror novel or movie that is actually all short story that just goes for it and does not give us a nice little tied up happy ending or any sense of hope or anything. I mean, that is by far my preference in horror, I'm afraid. I don't like the happy ending. I, I've come to accept the concept of hope in horror, though, um, but I think that hope comes from the relationships that we build in the stories that we're telling, and you need to get to the end of, uh, of a piece of fiction and feel a sense of hope for those characters. We were talking before about how it doesn't just end, you know, obviously life goes on, but Urshi, you said you, a story's got to stop somewhere that we're telling, but life goes on after. And I but, guess even in the worst horror story, you you can imagine this future life in, in the future. So that's the kind of sense. I'm, but I, I love the nastiest endings that can be. But there's what, like, just to, add, to, to piggyback on you, like, the thing about nihilism is it's like, well, why did... Why is a reader reading it, and why did you tell it? And it's like I think it's okay to to give to offer rays of light through that kind of story because the world we're living right now, if you're looking out your window, you're kind of like it's already happening. Like I could use some help here. You know, I'm I'm okay getting a little bit of hope in my stories. Yeah, well, I think I think that this world of the last year and a half or so has changed, and even before that, because we had these terrible bushfires going way back. It feels like another universe now. Uh, which people are tapping all over the world now. We've got Greece is burning and Italy is burning and America's burning. Anyway, that's a whole other thing. Um, but I think that I, I do feel more hope is creeping into the stuff that I'm writing and I'm being less nihilistic a little bit because of that, I think. Yeah. Because yeah. it feels like it's a hat on a hat. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But at the same time, yeah, these are still the stories that occur to me. Like, you know, you can't kind of run away from the stories that are recurring to you and that present themselves up in this whatever little space it is that the stories present themselves. You can't run away from those, I don't think. I'm, I'm a sucker for a happy ending. I will admit, I, I, I am freely willing to admit this probably makes me a, a, a less sophisticated reader as far as that goes. But no. if everybody dies at the end, I'm just like, why did I spend all of that time rooting for these characters? It's like, it would be like being at a baseball game or, or, or uh, well, I don't watch baseball, so I don't, a hockey game where nobody wins, like uh, not even a tie, but both teams lose. And also we're gonna, you know, kill the goalie. I'm just like, why did I just spend all of this time doing this if it was just gonna be everybody dies at the end? So uh, yeah. But not everybody has to die. It's not. It's not. Not even about everybody dying. But it's about a sense of reality about life being pretty awful quite a lot of the time, and doesn't always end well. I suppose you know. Yeah, but I mean, I'm I'm living in reality. I'm not reading for for over it. So, but yeah. it's, it's entirely you know. There are some people who love that, and and as you've said, are absolutely uh, that's what they want. Whereas if if I realize that an author is uh, just is going to have a, a grim ending on every book. They basically get like two books and then I'm like, yep, I'm out. I'm sure you are a genius, but can't, I really don't want to spend time with these people just to watch them all suffer horribly. And, <laughs> but you know, I, but I, I read other stuff. stuff as well. I read crime and I don't really read romance, but big family saga sort of stuff. And those ones, I definitely want your happy endings. Those ones I want a different kind of resolution. So I'll read a different kind of book for different kinds of resolutions, I suppose. Absolutely. And, and I, I've often said that, as has been argued many, many times, and I won't resuscitate the argument here, the, the critical feature of romance as a genre, uh, as opposed to, you know, romance as literary, whatever, is that you have to have a happily ever after. If you don't, whatever you're writing, it is not genre romance. And, uh, and about once a year, I think we have to refight that fight on social media. But uh, I think that the reason that uh, it's not necessarily popular, but because there is a, a people are willing to sort of relax and give the author more uh, and uh, uh, trust the author more with their emotions because they know at the end there'll be a payoff. And in horror, I think uh, to a certain extent, you need the reader to trust you to take them someplace really dark and weird and scary and uh, this is where horror, you know, you, you 
get used to certain authors, I suppose. It's like, okay, I know this author will take me someplace weird and scary, but they will drop me back at home afterwards, as opposed to this guy's gonna strand me in the woods. So. Well, I've always, I've never really, until people were talking about it today, I never really thought of like a, that I read for an outcome of whether somebody wins or loses. I read to find out how did, what are these people going to do? How's this going to impact them? How are they going to change? What's it going to force them to do? How do they face this at the end? I don't really care whether they live or die. Actually, I'd rather they die probably or something really horrible happened to them. Uh, <laughs> damn for eternity or whatever, because I want to see how they face that. Um, I don't know. I guess that comes from growing up in the family. I did. <laughs> it's like, how do you face this horrible stuff that's out there? That's the stuff I need to know. I don't need to know how to like win. I know that's easy. Winning once you've won, you're like, hooray, let's celebrate. I need to know what I do once I'm coming from a children's book author background. (laughs) They don't let you get away with that if you're I bet they don't. I bet they don't. No, my running joke whenever I did interviews was that inside every children's book author is a frustrated horror author because there comes a day when all the things they wouldn't let you do every time your editors like can't put this in a children's book it like just get it, it lodges in your chest and eventually compresses into diamond and you're like nope that's it i'm writing a book and i'm putting all of it in there and no <laughs> one can stop me that's awesome so another question we got i think this may may have been one that maybe you were to mentioned earlier uh, is is the thrill of horror a kind of delight we had as children so love of horror is fundamentally immature, question mark. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's fundamentally immature. I also liked eating as a child, and that doesn't mean gastronomy <laughs> is a fundamentally immature, you know, love. Uh, I, uh, love is love. You know, what, what is mature, you know, what is a mature thing as opposed to an immature, you know, love? I, I don't know. Uh, I do think that uh, kids love horror kids love horror a lot more than uh, editors or parents or librarians are willing to allow, I think. Uh, so there's, if you are writing for children, you, you are often fighting a battle of, but I know the kids would love this versus your editor going, yes, but their parents are the ones paying for the book. <laughs> so... Yeah. And to that point, I I think one of the things that we get relief in horror from is not only identification with the character, but sometimes identification with like what we see the author doing. Um, And I I remember I have such one of the first books I absolutely loved was, uh, believe it or not, a a middle grade novel by Clive Barker uh, called The Thief of Always. I don't know if anyone knows this book. Oh, yeah, yeah, Um, yeah. I was, that was the first like proper spooky thing that I was allowed to read as a child before my parents knew anything about Clive Parker and like banned him from our house. Um, But I, what I loved about that book was I could see that Barker had the same sense of revelry and joy and um, like intrigue in the things that were dark and in the things that I was not supposed to like. And I think that horror can also provide a sense of relief in that type of identification as well. I, I so, am uh, possibly a Philistine, but honestly, I like Barker's uh, children's books way more than his book for adults, because for adults, he seems to get very hung up on how clever he is and how labyrinthine he can make the plot whereas for kids uh things are stripped down to a point that i am like yes this is this is working uh i also if you haven't read um aberat uh the other kids book by him yeah yeah i love those books (laughs) yeah anybody else have any thoughts on the the childlike versus immature i guess i don't know like there are lots of, of scary sorry didn't mean to interrupt you go i want to i was just gonna say like the things we love um and are most sen- we're also always most sensitive about it's easy to call horror anything we love immature you know what i mean like that i, I like that's just what like i love the hunger games does that make me a child like i don't know i do it's okay <laughs> I know, I'm sure you guys have all had this as well, but people say, I used to read horror. I get lots of people saying, oh, I used to read horror and science fiction, but I gave it up as if they're too yeah. mature now to read it. Like, 
You know, I'm not impressed. That person goes off on my shit list. They really do. They think they're too mature to read horror or science fiction and think losing track of the fact that we're actually, you know, horror and science fiction is, is so observational and so, like, all of this stuff we're, we're talking about here, it's not a shallow, it's not, we're not telling shallow stories, we're telling really pretty uh, thoughtful and thought-provoking stories, I think, and grown up should still be reading them. But they take great pride in it. I, I will say that my last book was not called horror. They called it a thriller and a ton more women read it than had ever right. read it in my previous books. And I was like, why don't you? And it's all because they don't want to watch, they don't want to read about women getting stabbed. Yeah. And it's like, that's pretty valid. Um, yes. There is yes. like a weird problem with some horror. In that it's way. a marketing yes. thing. I think that uh, if you you if you write horror, you sell X number of copies. If you call it a supernatural thriller, you sell X squared number of copies. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's just in a name. I will I think say part though, of it is just people identifying horror with movies. I mean, if if what they think horror is is slasher movies, then yeah, they're gonna they're gonna think that you know, every horror novel is gonna be about slicing and dicing women because so many horror movies are. Uh, as far as uh, children's stuff, I will say, like, a vast number of authors I know have the kind of origin story, for lack of a better term, of uh, either reading Stephen King novels at an age where they will all admit they were way too young to be reading them, but they read them anyway, or reading um, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, which was a, a sort of classic children's book that all the school libraries had and the number of us who who i have talked to who came in through oh my god yes the one uh, with the yeah and part of those were the illustrations really sold it they had a really genius illustrator but it's uh, the number of people in the field who started with that is it's it's almost a cliche now i know that as far as teaching workshops for um especially i guess high school students the absolute glee they have in being able to tell horror stories. Like, I love the fact I'm a horror writer and it frees them up to tell their own really nasty stories. I don't say to them, no, you can't have someone getting their heads chopped off or, you, you know, you can't do all this sort of stuff. They love the fact that um, they're allowed to tell the, the scariest stories they can tell because often I think people uh, think it says something about them as humans, the sort of stories they want to tell, which I suppose we sometimes get as well. So they really, really take great glee in um, having the chance to put some horror concepts onto the page. Well, I mean, when you're sitting around telling stories around the campfire at camp, you are not telling literary fiction about the no. aging professor sleeping with a co-ed. No. You're telling <laughs> a ghost story. It's... <laughs> So what you, that's really interesting. That's another whole topic, isn't it? Oh, that's really fascinating. That that is definitely the stories that get told around. Yeah, I around mean, nobody campfire. tells a western. Nobody tells a romance. It's it's okay. I'm going to sit here and scare you, and it's just a, a. I don't know if that's just a cultural tradition that somehow uh, invaded, permeated the the all anywhere that uh, English speaking that I know of, or if. They do it in other cultures too, but yeah, you sit and around the fire and you start telling about the creepy thing that happened and the yeah. It's it's probably a simple kind of psychological thing where you're in the dark and you're already scared, and so you go ahead and control the scare. You laugh at the scare. You release this. You get the idea that scary things can be confronted because you've heard the scary story. It's gone. I, I imagine that would work really well for people that don't have electric lights and you know all the things that we have now and it's still probably you know a good thing to get back to you know karen you were talking about like how people get on your shit list if they say they used to read or whenever i hear somebody like that I'm, i always think how could you abandon all your previous selves and leave them behind you know i, I brought all of them with me I, the, yeah. the babies with me the little toddlers with me they're all me and it's like why would the hell would i ever give up anything I just add more things to it. I don't understand why everybody <laughs> seems to feel like they have to, to dump something in order to be taken seriously by somebody. It just feels so empty to me. Mm. Um, we've got 10 more minutes. We've got a warning, probably more like eight or nine right now. Um, uh, one of the questions was, uh, uh, well, one of the ones was just talking about, it was from Bob for Karen, but we can all answer it. What new horror tropes have you found? 
that you find interesting or effective. And a trope can be an old trope dressed up in new clothes. I make this argument all the time when I talk about, you know, horror. Uh, Jason and Freddy are a grim reaper. That's my, my shorthand for them. I mean, it's, you know, they have white faces that don't change at all like a skull. They're monochromatic in terms of how they dress. They carry a metal implement and go around silently harvesting souls. So they're not necessarily a new trope. They're a new interpretation of a trope that gets rid of all the baggage. But regardless, I mean, are there any new tropes that any of you found that you think are that work pretty well? I just reread Head Full of Ghosts and, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I, it's not a trope, but I love how it's both postmodern and horrifying. Um, and it's, it's really new, um, even though it, I guess it's six years old now, but yeah. um, things that are fresh and groundbreaking, that's, I'd call that one, definitely. That popped into my head too, but I just couldn't think what trope I would layer into it. And Nathan Ballingwood, I don't know what tropey stuff we'd lay at his door, but he's doing it. Whatever he's doing is new, I think. Well, yeah, I don't know what... It is that media thing. I think uh, there was a vampire book out like 15 years ago that started with like, like vampirism is actually a media infection which I think Paul was playing with too. But mm. Ballingrad is just in, in his own terrifying camp. <laughs> he is. Mm -hmm. I, I recently read a book, um, I'm probably going to mangle the title. Uh, it, it's by a man named Laird Hunt. And I think it's called like In the House in the Dark of the Woods. It's a, it's a very slim, maybe a novella. Um, and I, with that book, I had no idea what I was getting into, but he does this really interesting thing where he uses all of the grammars of the fairy tale, but does not speak the language of the fairy tale. Like you, you, he sets you up with like this, this thing that seems like it's going to be some sort of fairy tale retelling. And by the end of the book, you just have like no idea what like country you're standing in anymore. Um, I, I really don't know how to describe it any better than that, but if you have not encountered this book, I do, I do recommend it. That sounds very, very good. All right. Um, look at some of the other questions here. Uh, Bob's asking a lot of questions. So thanks, Bob. He's talked about a, an old blurb on a Richard Lehman Burke book that was like Stephen King without a conscience. And he said, uh, he asks, do we love horror because it unleashes our dark side without punishment? And we can be, we can either, uh, if you write it, you can actually you know, do it in your head, or if you read it, you can experience in your head the things that you would never ever let out into the real world for whatever reasons. I mean, do you think that's a big, big part of the allure? I really wish I had a dark side. Like, it seems like it would be cool because everyone else apparently <laughs> has one. But inside me, there are two wolves and both of them are like, uh, okay, what's for dinner? I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I don't know. Maybe maybe the dark side, as a like a personal dark side, is a as a concept is is not as universal as we think. Is I, I mostly you see if I see you know the dark side unleashed without punishment, I'm like that's terrible. That poor person. Oh my God, what are you doing? Get them to a hospital. So I'm not sure if uh, if. Uh, some people may love horror for that reason. I may have just been raised too Catholic or be genetically too Catholic. <laughs> I don't know. Anybody else have any thoughts? Are you unleashing your dark side all the time in your work or in your, the work you consume? No, everybody's like, no. I'm not admitting <laughs> well, to all those murders that I've done. <laughs> Unleash is a very extreme way to put it, I suppose. I mean, I, I do think that everybody has an element of them where they're not always feeling really common. Actually, maybe you're luckier than others or something. Like, I think that everyone has moments where they feel very, very, you know, feel dark, feel depressed, feel as if the world isn't a very good place and that sort of thing. And I guess it's more about that. So it's less about the dark side and more about acknowledging the fact that there's you know, I don't always feel like the world is a perfect place and my place in it and, you know, so it's, it's that, that's more the dark side. But without punishment, I don't, I don't really agree with it. I don't know 
what the others feel about that. Like, I don't know that I've ever actually written a story where there hasn't been retribution or some kind of response or reaction to the terrible things that happen. But then I don't like to read or write stuff that just terrible things happening for no reason. There's always a reason behind something happening. Um, I guess the idea of retribution means that, means that the, the writers or the readers, there's no retribution to them for having indulged their dark side by reading or watching these right, things. Right, yeah. We're not actually killing somebody, and so we don't, there's no punishment for us because we haven't done anything. Right. Sometimes I wonder if, you know, the, the dark side isn't like vocabulary applied kind of after the fact. Because my, my one of my former chairs was a very literary poet, and one year we were at a conference, and for him, conferences were wandering around whatever city we were at and never doing anything. So he was great to go to conferences with. Um, we sat down in the hotel lobby and he asked me, why do you write horror? And I looked at him, I said, did you remember that banana that we passed? He said, what are you talking about? I said, as we kept walking back and forth in this one stretch of, of, of sidewalk, a banana fit was there. Next time we came by, it was half mushed. The third time we came by, it was completely smashed. And he goes, no, I didn't notice. And I said, I see the squashed bananas. That's why I write horror. That's why I love it. <laughs> it's, it, it came from me first. It's what I responded to in the world. I don't think of, you know, why I think that it's, there's, there is a catharsis or whatever in exploring those things for a lot of people. I'm not so sure that it's, you know, I think it's looking at backwards in a way. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, do you, do you, do you feel like you're drawn to horror because some sort of darkness inside you makes me happy. (laughs) Makes me feel pretty good. That frequently when I write things, other people will tell me it is horror. And I'm like, what? I just thought I made an interesting fantasy thing. And they're like, no, that is really messed up. And I'm like, oh, okay. I see how you got there. Uh, And so I'm not sure if it, 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 some of my horror seems to be involuntary. Uh, I don't know if there's a dark side, perhaps it's entirely uh, either well hidden or I just think of something and follow it to the logical conclusion and the logical conclusion is upsetting. I think involuntary horror is some of the best horror. I love that. So we got one minute left. You want to go around and tell everybody where they can find you in the, in the world on social media or on the internet, Sarah? Sure. Or uh, plug something you got coming out, whatever you want. Uh, my book, Good Neighbors is out now. And uh, you can find me at sarahlangan.com and then at Twitter and at Facebook and at Instagram where I still don't know how to post. <laughs> Ian, how about you? Um, I don't do social media, but you can find me at ianmunashwar.com. And I also have a uh, psychosexual horror story called Dick Pig forthcoming from Nightmare either in November or December. All right. So you sold that one on the title alone for me. I'm, I'm there. <laughs> uh, Karen, how about you? I love that. Um, on, on Twitter, just Karen Warren and Facebook the same. So come find me. And I've just re-released um, my novel Slides with a new cover, which is very fabulous. Ooh, very um, yeah. And other stuff. But that's me. Thanks. Thank okay. you, everybody. Ursula, how about you? Uh, I am mostly, uh, for horror, will all be under the pen name T. Kingfisher, and you can find me on Twitter at Ursula V. My most recent uh, horror novel is The Hollow Places, and I've got uh, What Moves the Dead coming out from Nightfire next year, and uh, so, yeah, it's uh, Red Wombat Studio, if you uh, all right. want to find that. I'm Tim Wagner, look for my name. Put the two G's and an O in there. You'll find me on all the social media on my website too. Um, uh, so I think that's it. So thank you very much for coming, everybody. Thanks so thank much you. to the panelists. This is a wonderful conversation. Thanks for moderating. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Same.